Hello and welcome to another virtual Coder Dojo session for Crinion and Nog. My name is Rob O'Connor and I am a volunteer at Coder Dojo in Dunmore East in County Waterford. Uh, we haven't been having sessions during the lockdown, so it's great to be able to do these uh, virtual ones with all of you guys. Um, as with yesterday's lesson, it doesn't really matter if you what level of experience you have with computers. It doesn't matter whether you're a whiz kid or you've never done anything before. It's absolutely fine because what we're talking about here today is very much at the kind of the the the, the beginner level. Uh, and even if you are an expert, you never know there might be something that you can learn as well. Uh, today is slightly different to yesterday's hour of code activity, although we are going to go back to the hour of code towards the end. Uh, what we're going to do today is just explore a little bit about how computers work. Now, don't worry, this is not going to be like a big long lecture, so we're going to try and keep it relatively short. Uh, but I think it's important that you learn this because um, computers are such, such a widespread tool. They're everywhere, actually, at the moment. And just like a, an engine in a car, it's good to know a little bit about how it works, you know. Um, so without further ado, we'll start with the probably the most important part. And that is the brain of the computer, which is also known as the processor and also known as the CPU. CPU is uh, the central processing unit. Um, so if we if we think about the computer as, as kind of like a brain, um, uh, like a human brain, I mean, um, the CPU is the bit that does calculations and it does all, all, the, all the logical thinking and, and all the analytical thought. Um, it performs the sums, it adds numbers together, it can check to see if two pieces of data are the same or maybe if one is bigger than the other. Um, also what the CPU does is the CPU works through the programs that you write line by line and carries out the instructions that the programmer says. Uh, so like the program that you would have written in the hour of code yesterday or that maybe you've written elsewhere, the CPU is what actually goes through those line by line and carries out those instructions. The next important part of any computer is memory. Uh, memory is sometimes known as, or mostly known as RAM. There are a number of different types of memory, but we're just talking about it in a general sense here today. So RAM stands for random access memory. Uh, we love initializations and acronyms in computing. That's like where we take a lot of words and then shrink them down into usually the first letter. So central processing unit, random access memory, CPU, RAM. I don't know why this is, it's just the way it is, so you just go with it. Um, RAM is like the short-term memory of the brain, in that it's kind of what you're thinking about now. So, you know, if you think, like, for example, I'm doing this talk with you, so in my short-term memory, I'm thinking about, well, what we're talking about right now, and maybe what's coming up in the next bit, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, with a computer, RAM is the short-term memory. It keeps track of maybe the programs that are currently running on the computer and the data that those programs are using. So um, as you know, a lot of computers can be running lots of programs at the same time. So you could have a browser open. You probably have a browser open for this. Maybe you're running YouTube. And maybe also there's an email client open. Uh, and you might have Spotify working away in the background, maybe listening to some nice ambient music. Uh, you could have an antivirus program going, or maybe you were playing a game and you've paused that game while you're doing this. And all of those programs can be running at the same time in the computer. And all of those programs will have to live in RAM, in memory, in order for the CPU to work through them. Uh, we introduced a term there called data. Excuse me, I'm just going to have a, a sip of my coffee here. It's thirsty work. We introduced the term called data. Um, so data is, is, is the kind of the raw numbers that computers work with. Um, everything with computers ultimately ends up being a number. And computers use a slightly different type of number system to what we use. Uh, computers use a thing called binary or base two 
uh, numbers, whereas we, as in humans, we think in terms of decimal or base 10. Now, why is this? This is why. 10. 10 fingers. If you ever look at a, at a really small person, like a toddler who's maybe learning to count uh, for the first time, you'll see they often count in their fingers. You might see some adults as well counting on their fingers. Uh, and you have to think about it in terms of human history and how long humans have been around for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And it's only relatively recently that uh, lots of people are able to read and write and have, um, you know, have a lot of kind of what we would call basic mathematical skills. Uh, but back in the olden days, even like not too long ago, those would have been reserved for very, 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 very wealthy or very, very powerful individuals. Most people weren't able to do that. So, but counting in terms of counting on fingers was a really handy way of if you were trying to keep track of sheep on a field or whatever. You know, you could count them on your fingers and keep track of them. So that's why we count to 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Just checking. Still have 10 fingers left. Um, computers aren't very good at that, though, because they find it hard to... See, a computer circuit, it keeps hard, hard to keep track of a value like between 0 and 10. Where do you make those distinctions? The computer doesn't have fingers for it to count on. So with computers, we use a system called binary. And binary only has two numbers, and that's our two digits, I should say, which is zero and one. And what we use there is basically something is either on or off, or actually it's, it's high voltage and low voltage, but for all intents and purposes, it's on or off. And it's much easier for a computer to basically say, right, well, that's on, that's off, that's on, that's off. It's, it's either one or the other, as opposed to, well, is that a three or a four? I can't really tell. And any number in decimal, in, in number like base 10 mathematics, in, in our one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, etc., can be represented in binary quite easily. Uh, and computers, even though Binary is quite difficult for us to look at. For example, the number 1001110 is 150 in decimal. Now, I have that written down. I don't know this off the top of my head because I don't go around thinking in terms of binary. But for a computer to see 1001110, to us it would look like gobbledygook or just look like nonsense. But to a computer, absolute makes perfect sense. Uh, and computers can also represent uh, letters and other symbols like that. So there's an old system called ASCII, uh, which, which used to be used for representing uh, letters and numbers and symbols and things like that. And like 01000100 would be the letter D. And again, if we saw that, it would make no sense to us. But to a computer, that says, ah, put the letter D there and it can keep track of it that way. OK, so... I didn't mean to go down too much down that binary road, but things were going that way. So memory, CPU, and also data, which is in which in computing is binary. Um, one last thing, and I don't think you thought you were going to get into this, which was ancient Greek <laughs> and ancient Greek numbers. And we use these a lot in computing. Uh, so one bit is a single one or zero, which is a single bit of data. And if we put eight of those bits together, we get what's called a byte. And it's spelled B-Y-T-E. So a bit and a byte. So if you think about it, a little bit, bigger byte. A kilobyte is a thousand bytes. Actually, it's a thousand twenty-four. But for the purposes of this video, it's a thousand. So if somebody, if something is a kilobyte of data, it is a thousand ones and zeros put together to give us something. A megabyte is a thousand of those again. So a megabyte is a thousand kilobytes, which is a thousand thousand bytes or a million bytes. A gigabyte is a thousand on top of that again. So a, a gigabyte would be a thousand megabytes or a thousand million bytes. And then the next one up above from that is a terabyte. You might even have a, a terabyte hard drive. A terabyte is a thousand gigabytes or a million million bytes so it's quite a lot of these ones and zeros that computers are able to handle and all of those numbers uh, or those words kilo mega giga they all come from ancient greek 
And we use those for measuring lots of things in computing. So like measuring the size of memory or the size of, of hard disk storage. Uh, but we also use it for measuring things like the speed of the CPU. So CPU, the processor, that uh, is measured in a thing called Hertz. And one Hertz is one operation per second. So however many Hertz the CPU goes, that's how many actual operations that CPU can carry out in a second. So if you have a, you know, a fairly rudimentary uh, laptop that you, you, know, you might have bought recently, that might have a clock speed of two gigahertz, say for example. So two gigahertz would be 2,000 million operations per second. That means that CPU, that processor, can carry out 2,000 million operations per second which is a lot, if you think about it. And that's why sometimes the fan goes and they can get quite hot. Uh, so going back to here, the other thing that we need to think about is how they're connected. So memory and the CPU are connected via a thing called a bus. And a bus is really just, it's a system of wires or pathways that link various parts of the computer together. They're usually very, 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 very small. But the CPU and the memory on their own are kind of boring. Where's all the good stuff that we actually interact with? Well, that's all contained on a thing called the input-output subsystem. Again, it sounds very scientific. Uh, so this would be our hard drive, our memory, our keyboard, our mouse, uh, a printer, uh, a, a gaming uh, game controller, anything at all. Anything else that you connect up to the computer is connected up through the input output subsystem and that also goes on the bus to talk to the CPU and memory and other components on the system. And here's the thing, this is called the von Neumann architecture. It was named after an early computer scientist mathematician called John von Neumann. And this has been around for about 75 years. Now back then, Computers were absolutely huge. They took up entire rooms. They didn't do very much. They frequently broke. Um, but they, you know, they did carry out some very important activities. Um, all of the computers that we have today, or sorry, most of the computers that we have today, still follow this basic design, except they're much smaller, faster, and more powerful. This is true for all of the computers that are around you, probably. So if you have a PC or a laptop uh, or a smartphone or a tablet like an iPad uh, or a games console, if there's a PlayStation or a Nintendo Switch or an Xbox or something like that anywhere near you, they follow the same type of architecture as this here, as computers were 75 years ago and probably will be for the foreseeable future. Um, or maybe you have a, a relatively new washing machine in the house. Uh, there's a little computer probably inside that and that will also maybe follow the same type of architecture or the system that controls the traffic lights down the street. You have to understand computers are absolutely everywhere. And that's why I think it's important that you know a little bit about how they work. Okay, so that's enough of the kind of the lecture for today. And why don't we go and have a look at another hour of code activity, which to be honest with you, is a lot more fun. Okay, so let's have a look at the hour of code website again. Uh, so if you just open up a browser, any browser will do, any sort of newish browser should be absolutely fine. Chrome, Safari, Edge should be absolutely grand. If it doesn't work for you, try a different browser. Uh, and again, this will work on tablets too. So if you have an iPad or something like that, you can do it on that as well. Um, if you just go to hourofcode.com or if you just do a search for Hour of Code uh, in Google and it'll be there, it'll be the first one. Okay, and you might remember we saw this website yesterday. So what we're going to do today is just look at some of the other activities that you could do yourself to bring on some of your coding before we launch into Scratch, which we're going to start doing tomorrow. Um, now, as you saw from yesterday's exercise, there's lots of videos that come with the Hour of Code activities. Uh, they also give really good instructions as to how you should carry out the uh, solve whatever problem needs to be solved. 
So I'm just going to show you a little bit of them. And then if you like the look of this activity, maybe you can go and finish it yourself. Or if you don't like it, you can move on to something else. Uh, so I'm going to look at uh, just a few of them today. Uh, oh yeah, dance party. We'll start with that because that's really good fun. Um, this has been a huge hit at our dojo in Dunmore East. Uh, it's also been a really big hit uh, in my own house with my own kids. Uh, they love doing this. And I'll be honest with you, I've even caught a few third level students at WIT mucking about with it in the lab when they should have been doing some other work, but that's another day's work. Um, if there's any teachers or parents who are doing this uh, and maybe want to get a little bit more information, there's actually teacher's notes associated with a lot of these activities. So you can click into those and have a read of them if you wish. But if you don't want to, if you just want to get to it, just click start. Now, what's really good about Dance Party is that it's actually two, there's two activities. So there's the first one, which is a basic one, and then there's one where you go even further. Okay, now with Dance Party, it's got lots of music and you program uh, little characters, um, animals, to basically dance along to some famous pop tunes. So it works in a very similar way to what we've seen. I'm just gonna skip the first video because we've seen it before. Uh, you have to put in your age, and yes, I'm over 21. Um, it, it works very, very similar to what we saw with the Minecraft exercise yesterday. And if you, if you skip that one or if you haven't seen it, uh, I would recommend you go back and watch that and then come back and do this exercise. Or you can just try and give it a go. Maybe you're feeling adventurous. So we have our kind of uh, workspace area here with all the code that's available to, uh, blocks available here, our workspace area here where we can drag our code into. This is going to be our kind of little animation area where we see what happens with our code. Um, there's a whole load of different things. Up here actually is a good one, uh, good one to know about in this exercise because this is a whole load of songs that you can use um, with your code. So I'm gonna pick this one here, Outcast. Hey, yeah, why not? Um, and what this is going to do is if I click on that there and if I press run, I should see a cat. Yeah, that one is very basic. Uh, but if I jump forward, I'm going to skip the video. Uh, you can go and do these all yourself. But if I jump forward to seven, you get to something that's a much more exciting and a little bit funkier. Um, so with this one, what am I supposed to do here? Oh yeah, yeah, I'm supposed to make the things in. So uh, this one is using Justin Bieber. Um, I'm not a big Justin Bieber fan, so I'm gonna pick a, oh yeah, Call Me Maybe. That's a great track. Okay, and watch what happens here. Here we're coding up loads of a couple of different animals. We're gonna have um, some pineapples, we're gonna have a duck, uh, and they're all going to be doing some stuff. Watch this. You took your time with the call, I took no time with the fall. You gave me nothing at all, but still you're in my way. I beg and borrow and steal, I for sight and it's real. Okay, so you can get them to do all sorts of different things there, okay? Uh, dance party, I said that's really good fun. There's a lot in that and um, yeah, it's all, all, always great crack. Um, and as I said to you, if you finish dance party, and you like the look of it, there's actually a second exercise where you go a little bit deeper into some coding activities. So that's, that one is really, really good. Uh, I really recommend doing that. Um, another one that has been very popular with uh, a lot of people is the Star Wars activity. Um, now the Star Wars activity is really good. This one is a couple of years old. It came out with The Force Awakens uh, a few years back. Um, and in this activity, you in the videos actually, you meet some of the people who worked on those movies, uh, who worked on a lot of the animation and the special effects, uh, and were using computers to do that. And you write programs to control the robots, BB-8, or, uh, or later on R2-D2 to carry out some activities. Actually, we'll watch the first of, uh, we watched the first video. It's only short, but it gives you a flavor as to the kind of thing you can expect in this hour of code activity. Hi, I'm Kathleen Kennedy, and I'm the producer of Star Wars The Force Awakens. 
Today, you'll be working with one of our stars, BB-8. BB-8 is a spherical droid. Everything he does and every movement he makes is controlled by computer software. Computer science impacts every industry, from marketing to healthcare to film. In fact, hundreds of computer engineers work together to make a film like The Force Awakens. Hi, I'm Rachel Rose. I'm a senior R&D engineer at ILM, and uh, I lead the animation and creature development team. In The Force Awakens, I'm responsible for helping the artists develop rigs, which are the parts of the character that move, that allow the character to look very believable in a galaxy far, far away. In the next hour, we're going to build our own Star Wars game that will teach you the basic concepts of programming. Usually programming is all text, but we're going to use blocks here so that we can drag and drop to write the programs. To start off, we're going to work with Ray to program BB-8 to walk to collect all of the scrap parts. Your screen is split into three parts. On the left is the Star Wars game space, where code will run. The instructions for each level are written below the game space. This middle area is the toolbox, and each of these blocks is a command that BB-8 can understand. The white space on the right is called the workspace, and this is where we're going to build our program. If I drag the move left block to our workspace and press run, what happens? BB-8 moves left one block on the grid. And what if I want BB-8 to do something after the move left block? I can add another block to our program. I'm going to choose the move up block, and I'll drag it underneath my move left block until the highlight appears, and then I'll drop it, and the two blocks will snap together. When I press Run again, BB-8 will perform the commands that are stacked from top to bottom on our workspace. If you ever want to delete a block, just remove it from the stack and drag it back into the toolbox. After you've hit Run, you can always hit the Reset button to get BB-8 back to the start. Now, let's get rolling. OK, so the activity is good. They laid it out again. Um, so. We've got the squares and the grid, and we've got to control BB-8 to solve the problem. So in this case, you've got to get the scrap metal. Let's run. <laughs> Boom, he gets it. And, uh, that's all lovely. And uh, that's a really simple one, but just like with the Minecraft one and also with the dance party one, uh, as you go through the activities, they do get a bit more complex and you have to think a little bit more. Uh, a little feature that's really good with the Star Wars one, and it's not in, I don't think it's in any of the other error code activities. Is this, so we've been using the block switch or drag and drop, but if you're feeling hardcore, you can actually click into show code and uh, you can see the JavaScript code that's underneath it. If you think you'd prefer to work with that instead of the blocks, when you start the, ja the Star Wars activity, Instead of selecting blocks, select JavaScript. So if you're a little bit older, um, you know, maybe if you're, it says 11 plus, but I've seen nine year olds using this. Um, so in, you can use the blocks, but instead, if you would want to show text, you can type the commands instead. So instead of just dragging out two move rights, I can type another move right, and I've got to do an open bracket and a close bracket, and also a semicolon. Um, and then I can press run. Um, it's a little bit more challenging because as the programs go on, uh, or as the activities go on, the programs do get a bit more complex and you've got to do more typing, but it's a really good activity and you learn a little bit more about how, um, how real programming is done because most of the time in, in real programming, we're not dragging and dropping, we are actually typing. Um, if you use a language, even something like Python or JavaScript or C++ or Swift or Kotlin or whatever language it is, they're nearly all typed. Actually, they are all typed, not nearly all, they all are typed. Um, one other activity I want to show you about, and again, it's got another one with some great characters in it, um, is the Frozen one, the Coding with Anna and Elsa. Uh, now, this one is really good if you have somebody in your house who has recently been learning about geometry. If you've been learning about angles in school, like 90 degree angle or 45 degree angle, uh, this one is really, really good because in this you code up Anna and Elsa to cut shapes in the ice. 
um, with different angles. So again, there's videos and all sorts of um, in very simple instructions that tell you how to do this. Uh, I'm just going to jump forward to, uh, I think I'll jump forward to exercise nine because uh, the first ones are quite easy. Yeah, oh yeah, this one is really cool. This is where she makes a kind of a, a star in the thing. So I want her to do this code 90 times uh, now I know I'm flying through this, but if you're doing all of the Anna and Elsa activities, you'd build up to this. Uh, but I want to turn four degrees, and if I run this now, we'll see Anna make a really cool, or Elsa, excuse me, make a really cool shape in the ice. And doing all of that code 90 times. I think that looks pretty cool. What's good about that one is that if, if, you, if you don't know your angles and you need to just to be reminded of them, it does have lots of hints, hints in there. Uh, but you learn about things like this is 360 degrees in a circle. In that case, 90 times uh, by four degrees, so four 90s is 360. It's, it's quite a good activity. And um, I know my own kids uh, have, have quite enjoyed that one. So that, that, that's a good one, uh, well worth doing. Um, as I said, there's lots of activities on the Hour of Code website. And they're all free. There's, none of them will cost you anything. So they're well worth getting into uh, if, if you just want to have a bit of fun with some uh, computers and maybe some screen time that's kind of educational. Um, yeah, they're well worth doing. Uh, this one is very popular, Flappy Bird game. Flappy Bird, the game that will never die. Um, it's not really done too much for me, but I don't really like Flappy Bird. Uh, but there's lots of other ones there and you can have a scroll through them if you wish. There's a few other Minecraft ones as well that you might enjoy. So that's it for today's activity. Okay, so we, we've, we've looked at an awful lot of stuff, uh, if you think about it. We we talked about the CPU, the processor in a computer. We also talked about memory. Then I went off down a rabbit hole talking about binary and base two numbering systems. Then I started talking about ancient Greek numbers, kilo, mega, giga, tera. Um, and then we talked about the von Neumann architecture, which is something you can drop into a conversation to make yourself sound really, really smart. Uh, then we looked at some of the other Hour of Code activities that are there that you might like to try, um, whether it's funky dancing, science fiction robots, or working with a magical ice princess. So for, for an activity in an afternoon, that's not a bad bit of work. Hopefully I might see you back here tomorrow where I'm going to show you how to get set up with Scratch. Uh, the Scratch is a programming environment that we use in Coder Dojo and it's used in dojos uh, all across the world and for people who are trying to, who are learning program for the first time. So we'll get you set up on that and we'll run through some very simple animation code. So hopefully we'll see you then tomorrow. Thanks for your time. Talk to you then.